Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Proverbs, Proverbs 13. We're in Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, we pray for your blessing. We pray for your help. We ask you for strength, for forgiveness, for your mercy. Oh Lord, please strengthen us for to, tonight's study. Um, for what we must do tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Right, a wise son hears his father's instruction. You can insert the word daughter. But a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Mm. Now there's a good description of what a scoffer is like. Mm. Remember my description of what a scoffer is? Scoffer is someone who scoffs. Someone who says, pff, pff. Mm. They just, they almost laugh at the idea that they should have to listen to this stuff. Mm. And in this case, they don't listen to rebuke. Mm. From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. The soul of the diligent is richly supplied. The righteous hates falsehood, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. She's pausing for effect. <laughs> Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless. But sin overthrows the wicked. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. The life of the righteous rejoices but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. What's insolence? How would you describe someone who is being insolent? Disrespectful. Disrespectful, yeah. Someone who's insolent disregards authority. Mm. They speak to people with no regard to their authority or their position over them. Mm. That's a, an interesting picture here, isn't it? By insolence comes nothing but strife. Mm. But with those who take advice is wisdom. So the insolent person is contrasted with someone who takes advice. Mm. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Very good bit of wisdom there for anyone tempted to be trying get rich quick schemes, mm -hmm. multi-level marketing etc. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Mm. Whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. Good sense wins favour, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. 
In everything the prudent acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. All the F's there. Mm -hmm. A fool flaunts his folly. What's flaunting? It's kind of showing it off, isn't it? And that's true, isn't it? Foolish mm -hmm. people Parading. parade their stupidity. Mm. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but the f a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and disgrace comes to him who ignores instruction. But whoever heeds reproof is honoured. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. Hmm. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now there's a very helpful proverb. I mean, I don't know how you deal with this many proverbs in one day. The way we've dealt with it over the years is just to read it together. Um, we've often read it in, together in different translations, haven't we? So you would have the NESB and I would have the ESV. And we'd read it in bed together or something like that at the end of the day. And you can read it. You can read the Proverbs calendar. You can read a chapter of Proverbs every day, every month, because there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. And there's never more than 31 days in a month. So you can read, you can just keep reading Proverbs, which we did for quite some time, didn't we? I can't remember how long, but it was so helpful. But but inevitably, you, you can't take in all these Proverbs in one go, and so your mind just has to fix on one or two. And maybe it's a good idea to just write one down that mm -hmm. takes your fancy that, you know, you're, you're struck by and meditate on it, think about it, try and remember it. This is a good one, especially for teenagers. So what is it? Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. What's it talking about? It's talking about your company, the company you keep, the company that you choose to keep, because it is a choice, isn't it? I saw a tragic video of a girl being bullied by other girls, um, beaten and spat upon and tortured in many ways by just teenage girls, probably just your age or a tiny bit younger, treating each other appallingly. Huh. And um, the the... The reality is that I kept, I kept, as I saw this video that was in the news, uh, I, I just kept asking, why didn't she run away? Why didn't she just run? Sometimes you, you can end up being kind of stuck in certain company. If you hang around them, they can get a hold on you in more ways than physically. Mm. They can trap you mentally so that you feel like you can't escape you can't run away you daren't run away and and it's terrible but what the bible teaches you is to make wise choices about your company i'm gonna say make them early mm. learn to walk away from some people um, if you see people as foolish don't just hang around them all the time choose your friends carefully mm. try to be near people who and, and be around people be the companion of people who mm. are wise well, how would you know what wisdom looks like in someone well read the book of proverbs dummy mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like a terrible verse in Parable verse? Pa parallel verse in Psalm 119, <laughs> 63. He says, I am, the, I am a companion of all who fear you, mm. of those who keep your precepts. Lovely. 
That's good, isn't it? Mm. So, so what are you going to choose? This is a choice that you face just in terms of who your friends are. Mm. You say, but my friends are who my friends are. No, your friends are who you choose to keep being friends with. So why would I desert my friends? Well, if your friends are behaving foolishly, if they're fools, what happens to you according to this verse? The companion of fools will suffer, suffer harm. So your, your friend, if your friends are fools, well, it's going to impact you, isn't it? If your friends are wise, if you walk with the wise, you become wise. Mm -hmm. So the picture here is very simple. It's be selective. Be discerning. Don't just go with the crowd. Mm -hmm. And especially, there's a sort of a magnetism of foolishness. Mm -hmm. When kids, especially in teenage years, when people are daring and silly, you'll see people g gather around them like moths mm -hmm. to a flame. What does a flame do to moths? <laughs> burns their wings and kills them. So don't be a moth. Don't gather round fools. Scatter from them. There we are, verse 21. Disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. There it is, this is the verse. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Yes, but it says, if you spare the rod, you hate your child. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Mm -hmm. Whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent. Diligent. What does it require? Diligence. It requires careful attention to discipline him. Okay. Now, just a little aside there, the rod. We had a very interesting discussion about this in one of my discipleship groups when I was at Master's Seminary. And the question came up, is it, is it legitimate to use other forms of discipline? The Bible says, don't spare the rod. What does that mean? You have to have a physical rod and beat your children with it. Or is the rod a metaphor for other forms of discipline, including the rod maybe, but not exclusively the rod? Well, the answer to that question, we, we chased it down and got an official opinion from the Hebrew department, the Old Testament department, as they replied to our questions that yes, the rod in fact does refer in scripture metaphorically to discipline but it does naturally include corporal punishment so we would say smacking um, in England um, dis physical discipline is something which is prescribed by the Bible and, and if you spare it, if you don't give it you hold back from it, you hate your children. We live in interesting times. If you live in Scotland, it's banned. And by law, and you have to choose then. Are you going to obey God and the Bible, or are you going to follow the letter of the law? Obviously, the letter of the law is designed to, to prevent abuse and any form of physical discipline which overstepped the bounds of loving concern mm. and restrained careful loving 
discipline, obviously that would be abuse. And the law's there because there are many examples of people who do that, who beat their children and abuse them physically. And it's a tragedy. But nevertheless, this verse is true. Mm. If you spare the rod, you hate your son. Mm. If you love him, you're diligent to discipline him. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. All right, let's go to Ephesians 6. Children. <laughs> Thank you. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's also the first verse that you ever memorized. <laughs> and I can only really hear it with your cute little voice. <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> Mummy and I would try very hard to look stern. But right, darling, yes. <laughs> and did you obey us? No. <laughs> <laughs> you got to ask yourself, how, how, do you, how do you impose discipline in the face of such weakness? <laughs> oh, but we did. And it didn't harm you. It blessed you. And by the way, loving discipline faithfully applied does mean that children learn early to, to fear overstepping the mark to fear disobey disobedience and and the the necessity for that physical discipline diminishes the decreases very rapidly um when it's rightly applied anyway um verse two Honour your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. That's written to encourage children about the seriousness of obedience. Mm. So he's saying it's, it's a commandment with promise. He's quoting the Old Testament and saying, look, this, was this commandment was given to Old Testament Israel with this promise of consequences for obedience. And consequences for disobedience, not just from their parents, but from God. Now, in their case, the consequences were connected with the land of Israel. Um, in our case, we don't have that connection, but we do have the reiteration of this promise. So, beware, children, you're not going to get away with it. <laughs> you may get away with it. Um, superficially but God is not mocked God is not cheated verse 4 fathers do not provoke your children to anger this is the flip side isn't it we're talking about discipline one of the ways to provoke your children to anger is by giving them physical discipline which is disproportionate to what they've done. So if you, if you really smack your children hard mm. when they've done something minor that really just required a reprimand, mm. um, it, it, it is possible because children have this innate sense of justice, don't they? It's possible to provoke them to anger. Mm. It's possible to to make them just see that you're, you're, you're out of order and they resent you. And, and fathers are particularly warned, don't do that. But what's the, what's the alternative? Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, one, another way to provoke your children to anger is not to discipline them. I've actually got written in my the notes in my other Bible, which is currently being rebound. <laughs> whoop whoop at long last. Um because Titus kind of fell out. <laughs> so did Philemon. And Hebrews is falling apart and a bunch of other stuff. Anyway, the notes I've got written in there list I I've got a list of a whole lot of different ways that 
fathers can provoke their children's children to anger. Neglect is classic. Um, obviously, uh, I- inconsistent, incomprehensible discipline. Discipline that just doesn't make sense. Discipline that's out of, out of sense of proportion. Just being angry with them all the time without reason. Um, neglecting them, obviously, uh, you know, any kind of abuse that would that would categor- be categorized legitimately as abuse is going to legitimately provoke your children to anger. The, the counterpart of it is bringing them up. That inf- that implies involvement, doesn't it? It implies taking time to to raise them, to actually give input. And, and in what area, especially here, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Huh. So fathers, it's your job. Don't don't forget it. Don't ne- don't neglect it. Don't say, well I'm busy. I'm busy at work. That's what, um, that's what their mother does. Well, it's addressed to you. Be involved. Mm-hmm. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Any slaves listening? Okay. Well, you're an employee. Maybe not a slave, but sometimes being an employee when you can't leave is a bit like being a slave, isn't it? And you can't just quit your job and go and get another one. Um, if you know that you're stuck, your your earthly masters, your bosses, can have remarkable power over you. It can be like slavery. Well, if it was slavery, what would Paul say to you? Oh, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Rendering service, that service to your earthly masters, with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. So here you go, revolutionary approach to being an employee. Serve your bosses as you would serve Christ. What? (laughs) Tom, you cannot be serious. You don't know my boss. I don't need to know your boss. I just need to read the Bible. Have a read of 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says the same thing to slaves in 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. You know, he's like... You've got then the word he Peter uses there in one Peter chapter two um, for those masters is is despots, despotes in Greek. It's it's the word for an absolute ruler. These these are people can be tyrants. Okay, what are you supposed to do with someone like that? Well, obviously, if you can change your job and get a better job, do. Paul says that to slaves in 1 Corinthians 7. If you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of it. Go for it. If you can gain your freedom, (laughs) praise God. Mm -hmm. But there are times when you can't. When you can't, what are you going to do? And how do you behave towards your boss even until you can gain your freedom? Well, here's how you do it. You render service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. That's the opposite of um, the, 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 the kind of strike mentality, isn't mm-hmm. it? So this is, this is why Christians, Bible-believing Christians, time and again have refused to take part in that kind of industrial action because they said, look, I've got a simple command here. I know that my masters, I know that our bosses are cruel. They're, me- they're messed up. They're, they're not saved. They're, 
they're, they're, they're having one over on us. They're, 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 they're having a laugh. They just think they can get away with slavery. Yeah. Okay, and here's how Christians are supposed to tr behave in response. I'm going to render service with goodwill as to the Lord. I'm going to actually serve them. And people say, no, well, you what? You, you can't do that because then they'll walk all over you. But the Christian says, look, I'm not living for now. I'm living for the few. I've got, I've got an inheritance coming. I've got eternal life. Jesus is coming back. And he's going to reward me in heaven for all the suffering I have now. I'm not living for this life. You guys, this is all you've got. I understand why you want to fight for it. But, but look, I've got a hope of heaven. Be, always be ready, Peter says, to give a reason for the hope that is in you. When people see your good works, mm. and they're just like, wow, oh, they ask you, oh, how do you do this? Why, why do you behave this way? Why don't you spit in your master's soup? Why don't you fight back? Why don't you, why don't you rise up and put them down? That's what they deserve. Well, the Christian says, yeah, but look, I deserve hell. And they're lost. They're going to hell. I'm praying for them that they'll be saved. Meanwhile, God's put me here. I'm, I, God's told me to serve them. That's what he says. Mm. Try, try and read it any other way. I challenge you. Mm. Now, um, if you want to just carry on reading, it's always a good idea, isn't it? I kind of got carried away. <laughs> Verse 7, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does this, he will receive back mm -hmm. from the Lord, whether he's slave or free. <laughs> you cannot lose mm -hmm. as a Christian. You serve your master as a, a slave, as a Christian, as if you're serving God because of God. God sees it, God's going to reward you. Mm. Wow. Masters, now he flips the script, do the same to them. <laughs> what? <laughs> Rendering service to your slaves? Yep. <laughs> and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's some... Um, Pretty impressive enemy, isn't it? <laughs> when I was young, I used to do martial arts, and I would go into a fight in a competition. You'd look at the person that you're about to fight, and one of the things you'd look at is the colour of their belt, as if they were a black belt. They were better than I was. Did you ever get to the black belt? I never got to be a black belt, no, but I used to fight against the black belts in the competition. And when I went into the fights, I'd look at them and I'd think, oh. <laughs> because you look at them and you think, they're going to be good. I'm going to have the fight really hard. And, and this is serious. I am outclassed here. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am... This person is better than I am. Mm. Okay, now what? Well, what about this? What are our enemies? We're not wrestling, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Oh, that's easy then. <laughs> oh, nothing hard then. <laughs> uh, and, and how long have they been training for? Oh, yeah, like thousands of years <laughs> since the beginning of human history. These demons mm -hmm. have been practicing deception, practicing bringing believers down. Do you expect it to be easy? Mm -hmm. So so listen, 
One of the characteristics of true Christian life is struggle, difficulty, like battle. It's warfare. It's hard. And you get beaten up sometimes. So don't be surprised. That's normal. One of the first Christian books I read was by uh, the same person that wrote the Narnia series, C.S. Lewis. Hmm. And he wrote, wrote a, um, a book called The Screwtape Letters. Have you heard about that? Mm-mm. It's a funny book. I should finish this, shouldn't I? I should carry on with the Bible. Anyway, it, it's it's detailing the discussions between two demons. It's a fiction, obviously, mm. but it's the discussion from a senior demon, an old boy, to his nephew, who's a junior demon, <laughs> and he's telling him how to how to tempt and how to deal with this person who's becoming a Christian. It's just really interesting because it's a whole different take on... It's like, you know, try to get him to pray to this or try to get him to do that, try to tempt him this way. So it's a little um, insight, very practical insight into the dangers of temptation. I found it quite helpful. Anyway, um, just to say the battle is real. So, so don't be surprised... And do be prepared to fight. Now, how do we fight? Are you going to fight with physical stuff? No. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God. You want God's armour, don't you? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am doing and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ, with love incorruptible. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray that you would help us to take up this armour and to be ready to fight, to be ready to stand in the evil day. Please help us, forgive us our sins, Please lead us in the truth. Please deliver us from evil. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, we are done. God bless you. We'll be back with you again, God willing, tomorrow. It's only a day away.